of the and our recordings in progress of the National Parks Association of New South Wales. I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's edition of our Connecting with Nature series um, and begin by paying my acknowledging that we're meeting variously on Aboriginal land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Tonight's a, um, a really exciting part of our series. It's a little different than what we've experienced before in that we've got in fact, three speakers or one and a half speakers, it depends how you do <laughs> mathematics, um, uh, in that we've got a bit of a tag team going for, the, um, for, for part of it. But it's really focused around what's emerging as an incredibly critical issue for not just NPA, but also the conservation movement in New South Wales and nationally, which is the future of public native forests and the future of the forest estate, um, particularly down the, the, the Great Divide Eastern Ranges. So tonight's an opportunity to grapple, I guess, on two levels. One's the, the one that most of our colleagues across the conservation movement are really focused on at the moment, which is, is it actually a sustainable thing that we're doing in our public native forests at the moment, particularly those that are being used for wood production. But um, I think it's fair to say that we're all reasonably familiar with the drivers of that debate, you know, when they are looking at the calamity, which is the extinction crisis that's sweeping across that forest estate, the extraordinary impacts of the 2019-20 fires, and more generally, the, the fact that the context in which our forests sit is changing so radically because of the levels of vegetation clearance across our state. So, you know, basically they, compared to the rest of the vegetated estate, they're becoming increasingly um, a higher proportion. So there's a whole bunch of drivers out of forestry, but we all know that there's only so far you can go with fear and loathing. And what we're really talking about tonight is the much more important proposition, which isn't why shouldn't we be in commercial forestry in New South Wales, or certainly commercial forestry in the public native forests. But in fact, what is the better future that sits here if we look at it in terms of the advantages of creating protected areas that are actually of a scale complexity that they will be resilient to the challenges of the future. And the thing I'm really excited about with tonight is that we've got two new perspectives on what's special about creating a large national park, what it offers in genuine triple bottom line, bottom line terms. So it's not just about the environmental gains but it's about how the future that sees conservation as your primary land use actually delivers to communities socially, culturally, economically, in terms of regional employment, all of the comparators that in fact we'd use in any decision about alternative futures, alternative pathways for land management. So tonight's Obviously, in the context of our concerns about um, the continuation of commercial forestry, but in truth, the heart of this is actually about what's the better future that's on offer for the Great Koala National Park. Um, just a couple of mechanical pieces before we move to our speakers. You Most folk will be aware of, I guess, the, um, the way our Zoom calls are set up, but we won't take questions through the course of the presentation, but what you can do, if you've got comments that you'd like to make, by all means, if you just hover your mouse, your cursor down over the bottom bar, you'll see there's a chat function there. And you can put things into the chat if you're simply sort of passing observations. But if you want to ask questions to any of the speakers, if you go to the far right-hand corner of that, um, that bottom cursor, not the leave button, but just to the left of the leave button, you'll see one called Q&A. And if you write your questions out, I'll make sure that those are passed on to our presenters um, at, the, uh, at the end of their presentations. So look, without further ado then, I'd like to start off by passing over to 
Danielle and James, who are going to talk to you about some of the recent happenings up in Coffs Harbour off the back of the parliamentary inquiry into forest products, visiting Coffs Harbour last week to um, talk about the future of the forest products industry. Thanks, Danielle and James. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Um, so unfortunately, James is going to have to duck away again. He's been trying to negotiate with our 14-month-old um, to go to sleep. So good luck, James. Hopefully he comes back soon. Um, before I begin, I just would like to ask you to imagine what a great koala national park might look like. It spans from the mountains to the coasts of Coss Harbour of the Coss Harbour region with ancient Gondwanan rainforests and the most diverse tall eucalypt forests on earth. It expands up towards the Clarence Valley and south towards Nambucca and Kempsey and inland towards Belagin and Dorigo. It is a large, it is a large scale park that protects not just koalas, but, but a vast range of forest dependent fauna remarkable coasts and rivers, creeks, streams, swimming holes that bring the local catchments to life. These eucalypt forests were accepted for potential World Heritage listing in 1999 by both state and federal government in the Northeast New South Wales Regional Forestry Agreement. So we have known for decades that this area is destined for a special place in Australia's conservation estate. Hi, well, my name is Danielle, and unfortunately, James isn't with me right now, so I'm, I'm reading his speaking notes. Um, we just joined NPA as conservation campaigners in a job share arrangement. Our background is largely in ocean campaign filming, advocating for marine protected areas through community education and mobilisation. The issue of ending native forestry and transitioning to the next generation of parks is new to us, as it may be to some people who have joined us tonight. Our first task at MPA has been to create a community forum on the Great Koala National Park to coincide with the New South Wales parliamentary hearing into forestry products in Coffs Harbour. The forum was a great induction into the issues for us. We met inspiring local groups and advocates who have dedicated their lives to vol and volunteering their time and energy to protecting our public state forests for us. I wish to highlight the word public because it's important to remember that our state forests are in our public hands. We as a community control the destiny of these lands. The question for us as a community is, are we happy to continue with unsustainable native forest logging or will we get behind the transitioning of these remarkable public lands into Australia's National Park Estate? Um, and this photo is a photo we took last week uh, where we went to have a look at some of the, the logging breaches um, with ecologist Mark uh, Graham and also independent um, the independent parliamentary representative Justin Field and his advisor. Oh, sorry, just go back. One comment that stood out to us um, on the night of the forum was by MC Gary Dunnett. He said that the 900th National Park in New South Wales was created only a few weeks ago. That's over 7 million hectares of land which generations over more than half a century felt deserve high levels of protection. Gary hopes the Great Koala National Park will be Park 901. He believes it will, it will be the masterpiece of New South Wales parks over this coming decade. Tonight, I'm going to give you an overview of what we discussed at the forum. Gary did an excellent job of setting the scene, establishing why the dream of a great koala national park is important and emphasise just how realistic this dream is. While MPA's dream of shifting 140,000 hectares from state forests designated for logging into national parks sounds like an idealistic, impossible dream to some, MPA has a proven track record of parks creation. 
MPA has been a key driver behind proposals to create national parks for over 60 years. Speaker Dalen Pugh from the Northeast Forestry Alliance, in fact, recalled that MPA helped him with his first national park proposal in the Upper Clarence. The proposal was accepted. Great, great news. <laughs> um, Dalen's overall presentation had a humorous twist to MPA's proposal for the Great Koala National Park. His speech was about renaming the park entirely. The new name he envisioned should be the Great Koala <laughs> Hastings River Mouse Spotted Tail Quoll, Bard Frog, Rufus Grob, Scrub Bird, Clarence River Cod, Greater Glider, Yellow Belly Glider, Long Nose Potteroo, Brush Tailed Rock Wallaby, and Pepper Tree Frog National Park. Now that's quite a mouthful. <laughs> this is because there are so many endangered species in need of large scale habitat protection. He also said it could be called the Great Tourist Park with Professor Roberta Ryan's prediction that 9,800 jobs could be generated from this new park. Or perhaps, Dalen said, we should call it the Great Carbon Park. Indeed, there was, news, there was a news article only yesterday that said Tasmania has become one of the first places in the world to become carbon negative by reducing logging. So perhaps the idea of carbon parks is not at all far-fetched. Both Dalen and especially tour operator and ecologist Mark Graham highlighted the value of parks when it comes to water security. Mark argued logging eats away at our water security and our economic security. This is because logging dries out the landscape. Mark said the designated area for the Great Koala National Park is home to forests which have remained wet for millions of years. These are self-sustaining forests and create their own rainfall. The region is dependent on clean, reliable water coming from these forests, including for agriculture and fisheries. Moreover, hundreds of thousands of residents depend on forests for their clean water, including me, as I'm located uh, up here in the Coffs Harbour region. Tourism is also dependent on clean, healthy water as visitors come to see the beauty and cleanliness of the region. They will pay top dollar for it. So Mark presented the idea of creating the Great Koala National Park as more than just a koala park, but as a park that is about local water, food and economic security. Speaker Graham Tupper then honed in on the tourism benefits of a great tourist park, sharing his knowledge as a tour, tour business operator and a policy expert. He highlighted how tour operator livelihoods are built on conservation and protecting nature. This includes his previous tourism business in Canberra, which was only successful because of the popular demand by tourists to see a koala. He demonstrated how support for nature-based tourism spans all sides of politics, such as with the bipartisan support of a 2006 Natural Tourism Partnership Action Plan. He articulated how the Great Koala Park could be akin in global status to the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. When created, a great koala park will surely become an iconic draw card to both state and international visitors. It is important to remember the story of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. It was proposed in 1967 to mine Ellison Reef and between 1968 to 1970, six exploratory oil wells were drilled. At the time, a Great Barrier Reef Marine Park must have seemed an impossible dream for those advocates involved. Fortunately, public concern drove the creation of the world's iconic Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. Key events like the Forum and tonight are essential stepping stones towards mustering the same level of public support for an iconic Great Koala National Park. Graham concluded by asking us to just imagine where will we be in 20 to 30 years down the track? People are going to ask, who was a part of that grand vision? Well, everyone tonight attending this webinar can pat themselves on the back in 20 to 30 years time because you are actively getting involved in making this vision a reality. In terms of our federal candidates, 
we had a federal candidates panel asking if they supported the Great Koala National Park and to find out their policy position. Some clearly show, shared their support for the park and others were a little bit vague. The Greens, Tim Knott and Labor, Keith McCullen, who provided a statement, um, were both strongly in favour of the park. In Labor's statement, it said that they will prioritise the creation of the park if it wins office. Liberal Democrat Simon Chasling wanted a more balanced approach to national parks and forestry, but didn't clearly state that he supports the Great Koala National Park. He said he would like to see outcomes that are community-based decisions rather than top-down decision-making. Kaz the Independent did go a little bit off topic on a campaign pitch. It was a great campaign pitch, um, but she never directly stated that she supports the creation of the Great Koala National Park. Rather, she said she would like to see science-driven decision-making. They Aspiotis from One Nation, uh, meanwhile said that she would like the community to make the right decision to protect Australia's lovable koalas. So let's hope that means in her heart that she supports the idea of the Great Koala National Park. Now, it was a high-level Q&A conversation which at last unfolded. The key theme throughout the Q&A seemed to be that the community is not being listened to. Many in the audience belonged to local community groups fighting forestry plans to log a section in their immediate area. The key solution put forward by the forum was that it is important for community groups to work together to put pressure on all levels of government to create change. Tim Knott said the best strategy for community is to first approach their state MP if, they, if an area near them is up for development, followed by contacting the federal MP. He noted the federal government has responsibility under the EPBC Act to protect the koala. If the federal government does not respond, then advocates could approach other political representatives, such as the Greens. If they fail to get any traction, then it's important to go to the media using community strength. These tips might be useful to some people listening to this webinar tonight. So I'll share one more tip that was suggested for those up against the State Forestry Corporation and its logging plans. Gary Dunnett said, go to the Forestry Corporation website and find other coops up for logging and get in touch with those local communities. It is important local microgroups join with other groups. It's all about strength in numbers. Um, and just as a side note, so these were some of the photos we took um, out with ecologist Mark Graham last week uh, to see what logging looks like. And you can see down um, here that there's actually key koala habitat um, trees that were sadly um, cut down, uh, which the loggers are not meant to do. Um, anyway, now back to the great tourist park. Uh, we are very excited to have Professor Roberta Ryan with us tonight to talk about the findings of her report, which looks into tourism and the economic benefits of the Great Koala National Park. I very much look forward to hearing your presentation. So back to you, Gary. Okay. Um, just, just before we introduce Professor Ryan, I just want to make a comment that one of the things we got to see last week was spending a day in the field with existing parliamentarians from New South Wales, um, who with you know, one exception, were what you expect from parliamentarians. They're thoughtful, they're reserved, they're non-committal. Um, they were overall, uh, I think, at least relatively receptive to the idea of the Great Koala National Park, but, you know, non-committal was the, um, the absolute flavour of the day. And it stood really starkly in contrast to the previous evening where we got to meet a whole bunch of candidates. Um, and that, that embryonic form of the politician are just delightful because they're enthusiastic. They want your vote. And they, they seem endlessly willing to break party lines. So we had the One Nation candidate proudly proclaim that she was a great supporter of the great Koala National Park. So um, 
we shouldn't write anyone off, but it's, um, I guess the, the challenge for our democracy is how we maintain that enthusiasm once they actually become parliamentarians. But um, so as one, one just little observation. The other point I wanted to just make for everybody is that the, the thing we're talking about, the concept we're talking about in the Great Koala National Park is really quite different to any other national parks proposal that MPA has ever developed or worked with. And part of the difference is that the area we're talking about already has 47 national parks and nature reserves in it um, and another 44 state forests. So this is a landscape which is at a scale which really puts it into an incredibly rare category as forest estate. You know, by the time we're up to 315,000 hectares, which is what the accumulation of that 47 national parks and nature reserves and 44 state forests are, the only things that are vaguely comparable to it is the Greater Blue Mountains World Heritage Area, Kosciuszko National Park and southeastern forests sort of are getting towards there, but they're actually not even quite as large as this. So this is a really special concept. Not only is it replacing a lot of pocket handkerchief reserves with one large one, but it's doing it in something which is almost unique in national parks terms. It's doing it in a landscape which is incredibly well watered, which is built on high productivity soils. And that is such a rare thing in our protected area network because to be blunt, most national bits are the stuff that no one else wanted um, because areas of high productivity got used for agriculture in large part or urban development. So. Um, in terms of its biodiversity capacity to have a well-watered, high productivity landscape that we know has this extraordinary range of threatened species, but also common forest dependent species at scale, there is nowhere else in Australia that the same sort of prospect is in front of us. This is such an extraordinary opportunity and the thing that brings me great joy is knowing that we don't just have to argue in terms of that biological extraordinary characteristics. We've actually got Professor Ryan to talk to us about the contribution it can actually, genuine contribution it can make to that local community and to that regional economy. So on that note, I would like to introduce Roberta Ryan. Roberta is the newly appointed director of the Institute for Regional Futures at the University of Newcastle. She was involved in the preparation of this study and um, all I can say is I'm looking forward to hearing her perspective on the Great Koala National Park. Thanks, Roberta. Oh, look, thanks very much, uh, uh, Gary and, and Danielle. And unfortunately, sadly, Danielle and I are not related. We've we've had the quick chat before the session to just check that out. Um, but very nice to uh, be here with you all. Look, it's I've got just a few slides. The report is publicly available, and as um, Gary said, it's definitely a collaborative effort with myself and my colleagues. Um, very uh, happy to take questions, but if they're a bit techo, I'll um, have to go back and check the report myself. It's probably helpful to think about the context in which we did this report. Um, we started working on it in late uh, 2020. Um, of course, that was the context of the 2019-2020 bushfires and uh, the devastating impact that those bushfires had on koala habitat. Um, we were we, we uh, competitively tended for this piece of work it was, uh, and really it was, uh, the, the seed was sown for this piece of work in about 20, um, in 2013, the whole idea of the uh, Great Kyle National Park came, I think from people involved in the, uh, in the, in the Bellingen Environment Centre. Um, we were funded to do this work um, by uh, Bellingen Shire Council, Coffs Harbour Council and, um, uh, the um, uh, North Coast um, uh, tourism people. So it was a, a, an interesting piece of work. We had a really good steering committee and got a lot of advice about the kind of inputs to put into the economic model. But I won't go into this to this slide because we've um, heard a lot from Danielle about the, the scale of the national park, the importance of it in terms of uh, protecting the koala habitat, these two significant koala meta populations. 
it's it's really of a significant scale and it crosses these five LGAs and the importance of that um, for us was that was the basis on which we we used uh, the numbers. So as I said, it was uh, it was first proposed uh, by the National Parks Association really to seek to address the significant loss of biodiversity. Um, and we were responding at the time we were doing this work to the then 2020 New South Wales Parliamentary Inquiry, which um, was pretty on the front foot by saying if we didn't do something about koalas, um, they'd be extinct in the wild by 2050. Um, and you know, uh, this audience here, of course, knows all of those kinds of figures. So our work was in, in a way, I mean, I, I put that broader context to just give you a sense of the, uh, I guess, the the climate, the political climate of the time and the opportunity uh, that was before us as it is now, I think, to say, well, there's a real uh, threat to the survival of koalas and this, um, this national park being of such a scale, as Gary was saying, um, really has only a handful of, of comparators in terms of other ventures of this scale. Our work was indeed narrowly focused to the economic analysis, but we really do need to be able to put the, uh, the economic uh, numbers and the jobs numbers uh, as part of our advocacy and arguments for the establishment of the, of the Great Koala National Park, or in fact, any, nowadays, any significant investment by government. So we took two economic approaches. We did two assessments. One uh, is a, st a relatively standard economic impact assessment, which seeks to calculate the net direct and indirect effects of an increase in investment in the proposed park and related spending in the five LGAs that I mentioned before over a period of 15 years. You might ask why 15 years, look, we could have done 10, we could have done 20. Um, the group that we were working with who were uh, steering the project and providing input, uh, we settled on 15 years. We also did an economic benefit assessment, which is, really a proxy or a willingness to pay approach, which places a dollar value on how much the community is willing to pay to preserve biodiversity. This is commonly used as an approach, um, both nationally and at a, at a state and, and territory level, particularly using, uh, it's, it's been particularly pioneered when um, research is done to say, well, what are people prepared to pay uh, to preserve the Great uh, Barrier Reef, for example. So in terms of the, the, uh, the inputs and the data that we, we looked at um, for the economic impact assessment, we, we took into account uh, three kinds of expenditure. One is the expenditure related to park establishment. The second is in term, it was in terms of park management. And the third was related to visitor expenditure. So to establish and activate the park, and, and uh, you know, I'm happy to talk in more detail about how we calculated these numbers, but it's all available in the report. Um, uh, we, we estimated that 145 million of capital investment over 15 years uh, would be required. Um, that includes things like you know, mapping the biodiversity, looking at tenure changes, habitat restoration, construction of a visitor center, visitor infrastructure, tra trails and tracks and so on. Um, and we also estimated there would be 128 million operating expenditure over the 15 years. Um, that's the ongoing construction, habitat management, and the operation of park-based activities. So in terms of this um, economic impact uh, assessment, um, we, our work uh, estimated that the, uh, at the end of this 15 year period, Great Khan National Park would attract an additional uh, 1 million visitors to the region um, who'd spend an additional, and I emphasise additional because we took into account um, baseline visitor expenditure, um, additional uh, spend of uh, 412 million in the region with a total, both direct and indirect economic output of 1.18 billion in the region. Now that's quite a large number, um, we were very conservative uh, in our estimates, and this is, of course, important to do in terms of doing this, this sort of independent and rather technical economic assessment. This will uh, create an additional 9,810 jobs in the region by the end of the 15 years. It will, and I, I did a fair bit of media around this um, when the report came out, so there was 
quite some discussion about the job losses piece. Um, we estimated again, uh, I think conservatively, 675 uh, job losses in the state forest um, native uh, logging industry in the first 10 years. There's reasons why uh, the data it goes to 10 years in that case. Um, and an additional biodiversity value, um, which there are mechanisms to uh, put a price on biodiversity of 530 million for the New South Wales community and 1.7 billion for all Australians. Now, I know this is sort of very dry economic data, but I mean, as Gary says, I think it's important that we can put, we can wrap some numbers around this. We can talk about the additional jobs created, um, as well as talk about the job losses and, and how we can um, support uh, the communities who face those job losses. Um, so in terms of the key messages, uh, the creation of the Great Kyle National Park will generate significant regional uh, gross domestic product GDP um, and regional jobs in tourism in a key industry on the mid north coast. There will be medium term job losses in the state forest native logging industry. Um, and but this of course is more than compensated by the creation of new jobs in the national park in terms of park management ecotourism. Um, and we think, and we engaged significantly with uh, local Aboriginal communities, and um, we think there's particular opportunities for uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in terms of job opportunities, and of course, uh, business opportunities as well. Uh, a planned transition away from state forest native logging is required. We know there's a precedent for this, and we could use other examples, uh, and many of you in the audience will be more expert in this area than me. But there is a precedent for the New South Wales government to support industry transition packages, um, estimated again conservatively at about two hundred and fifty thousand per full time uh, job, full time equivalent over ten years, and to buy back any existing wood supply agreements. And we estimated that would be up to about thirty million. Um, these numbers are not talking about the impact of logging on private land or hardwood. Uh, plantations. We specifically focused on uh, the, um, <clears throat> the, this particular sector. In the meanwhile, there needs to be more research and mapping to understand uh, the existing uh, situation for the Great Kyle National Park, uh, the, the area of the Great Kyle National Park post the uh, bushfires, particularly with respect to the impact it had on biodiversity and the koala population. Um, and we know that uh, people do value biodiversity and they're prepared to pay for it. Um, our report talks to a lot of those studies. It's even more the case since COVID. Um, and we know that uh, all the sorts of things we've talked about in terms of nature tourism, but also the capacity for people to, uh, you know, kind of get away um, and the value that people place on that um, is even stronger post COVID. And we've got some other research that talks to that. Um, and we certainly know that the do nothing option uh, will lead to koala extinction in the wild by 2050. So I'm very happy to, um, I'll stop sharing my screen if I can do two things at the same time. I'm very happy to um, take questions, but that's the sort of uh, key highlights from, from the economic study. Thanks, Roberta, it's really appreciated. And I'm gonna exercise EMC's um, uh, discretion to ask the first question. Um, and it, it is, to you, Roberta, I mean, we, we've all experienced in the last decade and a half um, an extraordinary backflip on the part of state and particularly Commonwealth governments where we went from the view that um, you couldn't possibly support the renewable industries because they weren't economically sound to we desperately need to subsidise fossil fuel industries so they don't get overrun by the, um, the advan advantageous economics of renewables. How do we challenge the, the current paradigm that says that those forestry jobs in regional communities are absolutely sacrosanct and that they have a value that can't just be measured in terms of the, um, the a replacement cost of alternative industries coming in? Um, it, it feels as though it's cultural and philosophical rather than um, economic and how, how do we crack that um, that change? Look, Gary, I'd definitely agree with you that it's um, it's it's a kind of philosophical position for some, isn't it? And it's certainly a political position for many. 
it's certainly not an evidence-based position. And um, for somebody who does, um, my working life is really about the application of evidence to policy questions across a whole lot of areas. Uh, don't let the evidence get in the way of some kind of um, political position. So as this work was um, designed to do, was really trying to bring some evidence forward about the value of uh, national parks and this particular national park. I think um, research we're doing around uh, why what people think about regions and uh, particular aspects of regions and particularly, I mean, I work at the University of Newcastle, particularly regions in transition, economic transition. What we're finding is when you get uh, to and do some high quality social research and ask people what, like citizens, statistically representative social research about what citizens think about these things, um, you find that those um, uh, policy positions are hard to sustain when you present this to politicians in terms of what the majority of people think about these things. A lot of political, as everyone here knows, a lot of the political response is what politicians think communities uh, think matters. We, we've just done a, uh, we'll be launching some of this work soon, but particularly focusing on the views of younger people in regions in transition. And of course, coal jobs are important. Of course, coal is important to the economy. Um, but you should hear what some of the young people want to say about uh, how these things, how these changes need to be made. So I think we've got to bring forward, the short answer in my line of work anyway, is to bring forward the views of communities to adapt, to show politicians that the community's views are ahead of them on many of these important issues. And I think we've seen this in the environment debate around climate change. We've really got to put stuff right up to politicians to say, you think you're representing a community, but you're actually not. And your views really are pretty out of date, even in those communities where they, they feel they've got a lot to lose. Thanks. It's, um, yeah, it's that sort of classic phenomena of our politicians, you know, seem to be about a decade more conservative than the communities they represent. Um, and we can't afford that decade anymore. Um, okay, so let's go to questions from the audience. The first is to Danielle, and it comes from Meriden, who, who really wants some insight into what the that community forum expected from the, and wanted the, um, the political candidates to do. Well, I think most people in the room just really wanted a, a clear answer um, in terms of what their policy position was. Were they in support of the creation of the Great Fala National Park? Yeah, just a for or against. And that question was asked as, as the final question on the night. And that kind of gave um, everyone a, a clear sort of feeling for which politicians um, were a bit more vague and which ones um, were dedicated to uh, actually establishing the park. Um, but it, it's, it's interesting, though, because um, Labor, who is the most support, well, one of the most supportive, the Greens and the Labor um, candidates, um, unfortunately, Labor wasn't there, but Labor has, you know, put forward um, this part proposal a couple of times um, in 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 their pitches to to win uh, government. So it is a shame that Labor wasn't there to um, to be able to share more about their views. Thanks, Danielle. Um, question for to uh, that I suspect is for Roberta. Um, from Gary Sher, uh, and it's how do you put a price on the value of conserving koalas? Um, and I'm assuming that Gary's not referring necessarily to, um, you know, the intrinsic value of any piece of biodiversity, but how did you grapple with that in the report? Yeah, thanks very much for the question. And of course, directly you can't, um, which is why we uh, do these kinds of uh, fancy economic studies because we we have to speak to uh, and in this case this is the sort of methodology that New South Wales Treasury uses to value government investment in anything. So what we were saying was two things. I mean, of course, you can't put a price on biodiversity directly, or you can't put a price on koalas directly. Of course, it's priceless, and uh, there's there's many more ways to think about it than this narrow economic framing that this kind of work I'm presenting tonight talks to. Um, but what we want to be able to do when we do these kinds of studies is say, look, we have to be able to speak the language of government. We have to say 
um, what is it uh, that we can put some numbers around to demonstrate to you um, how many jobs will be created or how many um, what the economic uplift of establishing the park was. So the first part of the study that I just talked about in terms of the economic impact assessment wasn't valuing koalas. It was doing a, an impact, an economic impact assessment of the value that establishing the Great Koala National Park would bring. So it doesn't talk to koalas directly and it doesn't talk to the environment directly. What it was saying was the, these are the sorts of numbers that establishing the park would uh, deliver over a 15 year period in terms of uh, gross domestic product, um, economic investment, visitation uh, value, and, um, uh, and in terms of the jobs that would be created. And of course, the jobs are really important, you know, that 9,000 jobs piece, because part of the arguments against establishing the Great Coal National Park is, is the loss of, is the loss of uh, jobs in state forestry. So, the, we're not directly valuing koalas, we're valuing, in this case, the first part of the study was valuing, uh, putting some numbers around using Treasury's own, um, New South Wales Treasury's own models, input output modelling, where you put in a pile of assumptions about, you know, how much trails will cost to build, how much a visitor centre will cost to build, how many construction jobs there'll be, those kinds of things, if you estimate current visitation numbers, etc. some of the things that I talked about. So we weren't valuing koalas, we weren't putting dollar amounts around koalas. In that first part, we were putting dollar amounts around the economic in, the economic uplift that can be uh, sh that can be um, put. We can put numbers around for the establishment of, of the Great Koala National Park, and we can find it to those five LGAs. But of course, the, the, the ba that boundary is quite narrow too, because visitors will stop and visit other places on the way when they come yeah. to visit the Great Koala National Park, and so on. The second piece of work that I talked about, which is that willingness to pay, it's how it's a it's a very standard a way of valuing something that's got intangible value. So, for example, the Great uh, the Great Barrier uh, the, you know the Great Barrier Reef, um, uh, lots of other national park studies use that, which is how how much money are people prepared to pay? So it's a proxy. So if you're prepared to pay, and I'm you know making it up, $130 a year. Uh, to make sure that koalas don't become extinct. That becomes a proxy value that people are prepared to put on koalas, but it's not a direct thing. And, you know, you don't, in those willingness to pay studies, say, well, is it koalas versus something else? Um, you know, and if you did that, you'd get different kinds of numbers. So I hope that answers it. No, that's, that's fantastic. And I've got to say, the thing that really I find encouraging in what you're saying is that it's an approach that looks at... Um, not just the community value, but it's actually looking at it as a an integrated system. One of the things that I guess as an organisation we've been getting really frustrated in when we look at various developments that are impacting on national parks is the view that you simply apply the Environmental Planning, uh, Environmental Planning and Assessment Act criteria for determining whether something's an unacceptable impact and for the most part, then apply biodiversity offsets figures. So, you know, for instance, with something like the Snowy 2 program, oh, well, okay, that you, you, you deal with the environmental impact by paying $100 million um, if you're Snowy 2 or if you're Snow uh, Mountains Corporation. And what's getting lost in that is actually that you can't reduce national parks, you can't reduce biodiverse areas to individual species that have a market value um, that in fact we've got to think about the value of that intact high functioning landscape as an entity in and of itself and I personally I don't think that the EPNA Act system does us very well at all where once we start to deal with cumulative impacts and once we start to deal with landscapes such as the Great Koala National Park um, Okay, so uh, now a couple of questions from Ian Dixon, and he was asking whether the, the changing circumstance of the last two years with pandemics and uh, obviously changes the tourism profile, um, would that have an impact on the conclusions of your report in one direction or another? Sorry, was that for me? Yes, that was you. For yeah, you, sorry. sorry, sorry. Run me that. Run past that one. 
ask me again, please. Yeah, whether the changing circumstances um, off the back of pandemic oh. to the tourism industry, mm. um, does that in any way weaken the conclusions of the report? No, I don't think so. I think it goes the other way. Um, okay. I think the, the nature tourism. So in, in terms of the, you know, what, what did we use as numbers to come to those conclusions? We talked about the park establishment, the sort of capital investment uh, required. We also talked about the ongoing park management and put in figures, figures for that. So one of the three um, uh, sets of data that we used in terms of uh, estimates for expenditure uh, through the economic channels. And the third was the visitor expenditure. My um, expectation is that the impact of, of COVID will increase nature tourism. Uh, fewer people, particularly people who, you know, might want to go to, you know, overseas and so on and who aren't for all sorts of reasons, not the least of which there's a pandemic on. Um, so we've seen uh, in in uh, across a whole lot of areas in which we work in a, a sort of a, an uptick in this area. So I think it would, the numbers would look better if we put them into the model today than they did uh, at the time we wrote the report. Thanks, and, and obviously it's easier to social distance in a uh, forest than it is on the forecourt of the Opera House. So <laughs> some, some natural advantages for us here. Um, next question to, James and Danielle, which is uh, again from Meriden, which is asking if there's illegal logging happening across the mm -hmm. landscapes of the Great Koala National Park. Well, I'm sure Gary's much more across <laughs> the issue than us, but James, do you want to sit um, just explain a couple of things that we saw on the, the ground while we were out there? Maybe introduce yourself because yeah, so James is meant to be. I'm James, <laughs> um, I am also now an MPA campaigner. Um, I've just got a little sick daughter at the moment, so it's been a bit challenging to get her to sleep. Um, yeah, so the other, probably nearly a week ago today, uh, we went out to some of the state forest um, just on the outskirts of Sandy Beach. Uh, just to have a look around at sort of the, I guess the, the impact that Forestry Corporation is having in their supposedly sustainable sort of forestry um, activities. And yeah, we went out with Mark Graham and Mark's very knowledgeable on the topic. And he basically showed us the impacts of what was going on uh, in terms of just the destruction of the forest adjacent to areas that they're actually going into log. Um, additionally, a lot of habitat trees have been damaged or in, even cut down and large parts of uh, rainforest adjacent to the areas that they're actually going in and trying to target have been pretty severely damaged by the heavy um, the heavy machinery that's basically moving in and out to, to remove those trees. So in terms of illegal, I'm not sure if like, are we talking like illegal as in poachers or illegal as in just bad Breach, practice and bad. breaches and yeah. that? Look, I, I might jump on in from there because there's a sort of a, an interesting story that's been developing over the last several years in New South Wales, which is we have a fairly extraordinary situation where the, the government authority, Forestry Corporation, which theoretically should be the ones who are actually regulating the way people behave in the forests, um, isn't trusted by government. And to the extent that the Environmental Protection Authority has a role in reviewing what forestry does. And people may have seen some of the, um, the conflict that was happening in the media where um, EPA was making directions to Forestry Corporation who said, no, we're not going to do that. And it got to the point of in the media landscape, one government agency saying they were going to, you know, they're going to prosecute another like this actually doesn't happen. This stuff's supposed to get sorted out by grown-ups in within a government <laughs> framework. You're not supposed to get to that point. Um, but in fact, it goes another layer deeper. I'd really encourage people to just put in a couple of search terms. Um, coast Watchers, which is a, one of our sister organisations down the sort of the mid-south coast, 
um, and Mogo State Forest, because what they've been doing is actually going into logging coops uh, in that area, sort of, you know, Bateman's region, essentially, and looking at whether forestry corporation contractors are actually abiding by the prescriptions in their logging plans. And what they're finding quite regularly is, no, they're not. They go out and collect the evidence, hand it across to EPA, who are then actually taking that evidence, um, replicating it themselves. And you do have to ask the question why they didn't get it themselves in the first place, but nonetheless, they, they, they replicate it themselves. And then there's been um, many prosecutions of Forestry Corporation and their contractors for breaches of the basic standards. And what we're talking about is issues as fundamental as retention of habitat trees, which are designed to ensure that when you do get regrowth, you've got hollow bearing trees and trees that are able to provide the next generation of seed stock for that landscape. And also things like riparian corridors. So we have an extraordinarily dysfunctional situation in New South Wales. But what Coast Watchers have shone a really big light on is that there is an extraordinary opportunity for citizen scientists and local conservation groups to hold government to account by doing what Roberta referred to earlier, which is actually bringing facts to the table. You know, There's something very empirical about this map of a forestry operation was supposed to retain these three uh, habitat trees and we can't see them. You know, they're not there anymore. That's, that's a very substantive piece of evidence. And so there is a genuine opportunity here because to be blunt, we can't take it for granted that the government agencies are acting in good faith in this space. Okay, that's not the sort of note I normally like to end this sort of thing on, but um, did anyone else on the panel have anything they wanted to say either on that issue or um, arising out of our panel discussion. Danielle, you're on mute. I'm not sure if you're wanting not to I, be on mute. I love point. seeing someone under 40 actually not knowing how Zoom works. So that's great, thank you. I feel much better. <laughs> Sorry, we have to put on mute just in case our, our daughter ends up screaming in the background. Um, sorry, we weren't quick enough to, to type this um, into the chat, but in response to, to Gary um, Shewer's um, comment before, um, we said it would be interesting to actually know the value of Aquila in terms of tourism, uh, because James and I are familiar with the, a study that found a single shark is worth um, 1.9 million uh, to Palau's tourism, like one shark, 1.9 million. Like that's, that's a lot of money. So it would be actually interesting to know what a koala is worth because people come to Australia just to see a koala. Yeah, they do. <laughs> look, I think um, the only thing I'd add uh, to every, to the conversation is just to say, look, of course um, we'd like, uh, koalas and biodiversity and habitat protected for its own sake. This is this particular study was uh, relatively narrowly scoped, as I said at the beginning. It's trying to speak to the people with pointy heads in government uh, to say, you know, the jobs numbers here look very compelling. Uh, the impact of the great the establishment of the Great Koala National Park is all upside, particularly for those five local LGAs. Um, within, within, within which it sits. So this is really trying to kind of take the argument um, up into that language. It's not the only sets of arguments you'd want to use, of course, uh, to support the establishment of the Great Koala National Park. And I myself find myself often very critical of those narrow economic arguments, but I think it's a contribute. We, we, we were very happy to do the piece of work. We think it's an important contribution to the debate to say, look, the economics of the establishment of the Great Great Kyle National Park are very compelling, never mind all the other things which all of us know. Okay, I'm going to ask one final question of Roberta and then um, we'll, we'll have to bring proceedings to an end. Roberta, you've produced a really compelling um, insight into the part of the triple bottom line for the Great Kyle National Park. We've also had uh, the former Minister for the Environment, Matt Keane, and in fact, the former Premier, both talking up research that Department of Planning and Environment have done themselves about the value of national parks. And they've been trotting around figures which started at 
18 billion a year. And I've noticed in more recent media has turned into 19 billion a year. So I'm not sure, I suspect it was one side or another of a decimal point, but um, nonetheless, that, that figure was trying to capture the value to regional communities of um, tourism and land management activity, specifically relating to our um, existing protected area network. They're two really compelling sort of pieces of work there. But I guess the question is, um, what's the next thing that we as a conservation movement need to be investing in to start to sharpen our focus and pursue this line that conservation actually brings benefits to the community, not the loss of access. You know, it's, it, this is not a, um, you're losing your forests or you're losing your native grasslands. This is a, there's an absolute net benefit coming to the community if we can actually do the carbon sequestration, biodiversity conservation, you know, fire management sort of um, initiatives that we all know will produce a healthier planet. Yeah, look, I, uh, yeah, I think that's right. And I'm pretty familiar with some of that data that um, you're referring to, but funnily enough, when we were doing this work, uh, the department was instructed not to provide us with anything other than the published, publicly published data. Now that the story has changed since then, but we were, when we were doing this, it was quite a hostile political environment. Um, even though you know, like we kept saying, "Look, we're from the university," um, but um, it was interesting because the senior people, and in fact, many of them whom I know well, have sort of privately said to me, oh, look, we're really sorry about what all, all that happened. There was just a particular political climate going on at the time. But I do think there's uh, much greater support for putting forward those, that kind, this, and this study uh, uses the same kind of methodology, um, those kinds of uh, economic assessment, because in the current context, in my read on the politics, uh, particularly at the New South Wales level at the moment, it's about jobs, it's about jobs in the regions. I'm. Um, as, as you mentioned, Gary, I'm uh, the director of a newly established uh, Institute for Regional Futures. I think it's all about the future of the regions. And I think the more evidence we can bring to bear to talk about how prosperity can come to regions through the support of uh, environmental initiatives and biodiversity and the preservation of biodiversity, the better everyone's gonna be. But at the moment, the number that really speaks to, the numbers that really speak to the argument are about jobs. Um, because of the concern about high quality, well paid jobs in the regions um, with the transition away from coal, of course, as well. So I think I think those job numbers and certainly when we we released the report and we did a kind of round a lot of uh, I mean, we did national media on this. Um, it was picked up everywhere. It was that jobs number um, and it was the people who opposed these studies uh, um, wanted to take us on over those job numbers. It was very interesting to see the yeah. political reaction to that. Yeah, well, interestingly, last week when we were in the field talking to the members of the Legislative Council, a number of them started from the proposition that, you know, the Great Koala National Park would see a step backwards in terms of economic activity and jobs because, of course, NPWS would just have to spread itself thinner. And we're saying, well, no, you actually need an establishment package, you need a transitional package, and... Um, I was able to talk to them about having had the experience as an NPWS regional manager of getting staff who come in from forestry transitions, and they end up being some of your most productive staff. They're like the, the basic skills of land management are incredibly transferable. And um, at least that small group of parliamentarians, I think, got the message that this isn't about scrimping and saving and defaulting to the lowest possible value land management model, this is actually about having something really special that you have to resource. Indeed, yeah. indeed. And the job numbers we talked to in the report were not just tourism numbers or visitor economy yeah. numbers, they're land management yeah. uh, job numbers as well, which of course you can't have a national park uh, without those. And that's a, that's a critical, important long-term workforce uh, in our regions. Alrighty, um, I've got to say, I'm really pleased to see that it's 8.00. So we've sort of hit our target of exactly on eight o'clock. I, I just have to thank everybody who's participated tonight, but most particularly um, Professor Ryan and Daniel and James, your time's incredibly appreciated. It's been a, um, a really 
stimulating discussion and a hopeful discussion, which I think is a really nice way to finish at um, eight o'clock on a Wednesday night. All right, bye all. <laughs> See ya.